Ah, yes. Looking at battle paintings in an art gallery. It is a pastime for me now, now that I am retired from the army. It is hard for me to believe that it is years since I saw my last battle. And with that battle, the fall of the Grand Empire of France. Yes, I, Frédéric Gautier, served with Napoleon from the early days of 1796 to the end of an era in 1815. Those were the most important years of my life. And in these battle paintings, I relive those years, the Napoleonic era. Take the painting over there, for instance, one of my favorites. It was 1796, the first time I saw General Bonaparte, Napoleon, as the world came to know him. We were an invading army in the mountains of Italy. But our invasion of Italy was going badly. We, the soldiers of the French Republic, were hungry, ragged, dispirited. I was a young lieutenant then. Like the other men, my morale was low. And then our new general appeared. He was young, thin, intense. I can still remember his face the face of the young officer who, six months before, had commanded the troops that put down an uprising against the Republic. His reward was command of the army of Italy. Soldiers, he said, I will lead you to the most fertile plains in the world. And he did. Through the mountains, down into the Po Valley, and on to the plains of Lombardy, in a swift, brilliant campaign, he conquered northern Italy. By 1797, Belgium and the Rhineland were under the control of France. Holland and Switzerland were added the following year. In 1798 came the audacious invasion of Egypt. Even though our victories were cut short by the sea power of Great Britain, Napoleon was making history. He was a hero when he returned to France. In 1799, I was the general's aide for a time in Paris. I remember how the citizens showed their enthusiasm for Napoleon whenever he appeared. In these demonstrations, Napoleon clearly sensed the unpopularity of the government. He was right. Everywhere, Frenchmen were grumbling about corruption, high taxes, the people were ready for a change. And a sudden change came as Bonaparte achieved his coup d'etat. He overthrew the government of the directory. I remember the scene as the deputies took an oath to the new consulate. In reality, the first consul, Napoleon, had made himself master of our French Republic. I remember what he said as first consul. My policy is to govern in accordance with the wishes of the great majority. And govern he did with great energy and will. The Luxembourg Palace in Paris became the center of an efficient administration. As first consul, Napoleon restored public order, collected taxes, re-established the credit of the government. With equal energy, Napoleon extended French power. The Austrians were crushed and peace imposed on England and Austria. By 1802, France had triumphed over all her foes. Meantime, our new Bank of France helped to speed financial recovery. Changes came to the law courts too. The confusing mass of laws and traditions going back to the old regime and the laws of the revolution, were reorganized into uniform, workable codes. My uncle, a lawyer, often said that the Code Napoleon was one of the greatest achievements for France. In my own village, I remember that many of my friends were pleased with the efficiency of the government. Some were pleased because religious peace had been reestablished between France and the papacy. 
Others were pleased because the revolutionists' dream of a unified system of education for our young people was being realized. As I listened to my fellow citizens, I could sense their admiration for the government of Napoleon. Yet, I began to realize that we were paying for our efficient government by losing our own voices in our affairs. In Paris, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was the scene of Napoleon's next triumph. Here on December 2nd, 1804, Napoleon crowned himself Emperor of the French. Later, he said, I shall fuse all the nations into one. To achieve that end, Napoleon would eventually resort to aggression and oppression. I remember the emotional scene as his army officers swore allegiance to the imperial standards that we would once more carry to battle. Yes, those were the years, 1805, 1806, 1807, when the empire rose to its peak through conquest. Take 1805, for instance. I remember our bivouac in Austria before we met the Austrian and Russian armies. I can still see the long lines of our army moving into the decisive battle of Austerlitz. The fighting was bitter, but it ended with a great victory for France. After our victory at Austerlitz, the Emperor Francis surrendered to Napoleon. Francis surrendered his title of Holy Roman Emperor. After Austerlitz, Napoleon continued to remake the map of Europe. Lands were added to French control as the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved. The Grand French Empire, as Napoleon called it, included much of Europe. The symbol of the French eagle would now be stamped on more lands. Prussia was next to challenge the French. In 1806, the armies met at Auerstedt and Jena. I remember the emperor's leadership at Jena. The furious charges, the great masses of troops. We completely defeated the Prussian armies. Prussia was allied to France. The next year, 1807, the Grand French Empire faced a giant challenger, the vast empire of Russia. At Eilau, and later at Friedland, bloody battles were fought. I remember a summer day at Friedland when the incessant hammering of our artillery smashed the Russian lines. Napoleon was at the high point of his power as he met the defeated Emperor Alexander of Russia. The two emperors planned to divide Europe between them. After the Treaty of Tilsit, France would dominate Europe west of a line starting at the Niemen River and Russia east of it. Napoleon had now forged a huge empire. At reviews and celebrations, the people cheered their empire and their army. But at the same time, we were becoming aware that our empire was facing serious trouble. I talked with an old friend, an officer in our navy, who told me how much trouble our old enemy England was causing us. He explained that the English fleet was destroying our sea trade. English warships hung off our ports and we could not drive them away. To answer this threat, the Emperor closed the continent to England by a counter blockade called the Continental System. Napoleon signed decrees to enforce his Continental System. He wanted to make the continent independent of England and her colonies. But instead, we suffered financial crisis. Many French businessmen failed. Even our small shopkeepers felt the pinch of the economic blockade. The popularity of the government fell as the supply of certain imported goods, such as tea and coffee, became less and less. And soon, in the lands we had conquered, open opposition. This resistance to French oppression 
began in Spain, which Napoleon had seized in 1808. Spanish nationalists, helped by an expeditionary force from England, fought Napoleon. Resistance came too in Austria and Prussia. In 1812, Napoleon decided to make one more grand assault to crush his enemies. Russia was to be invaded. I remember the scene as 600,000 of us, the Grand Army, marched deeper and deeper into that vast land. At first, we seemed to win. Then, we had to retreat. It became a disastrous rout, the beginning of the end. We fought stubbornly, desperately, but a half million of our men were left behind in the snow and ice of Russia. The Grand Empire began to disintegrate. The nations of Europe united to begin the final war of liberation. At Leipzig, the battle of the nations was fought, which broke the empire's power. From many directions, the Allies invaded France itself. Even civilians fought, but France was overwhelmed by the Allied armies. Napoleon abdicated. The empire was ended in France and in Europe. Yes, an era had ended. The emperor made a brief attempt to return to power. But after Waterloo in 1815, his dictatorship ended forever. Ended too were the 20 exciting years of the Napoleonic era. Yes, Napoleon's ruthless ambitions came to an end, but many achievements of the Napoleonic era remained to influence France. France is still organized into departments and districts, as it was under the Napoleonic era. Many of France's highways were once part of the network of military roads built under the empire. The unified system of schools developed into the present system of free education. Freedom of worship for all religions remains one of the basic rights of Frenchmen. In French courts, the Code Napoleon remains the basic law code. And much of the French national spirit today is a heritage from the days of Napoleon. In one sense, Napoleon failed. He did not establish the flag of France over all of Europe. His dream of French military and political control of a unified European continent did not come true. Yet, since Napoleon's day, these nations have taken steps to work together. Perhaps the dream of a united Europe lives in a different and certainly more noble form.